How's it going everybody? It's Pilot Flan. We are back with another FPL video. Hope you're all doing well. And today we're going to be looking at the wildcard for Game Week 31 and my impressions on it and how I would go about drafting it if you have it available and that's what you chose to do after either the bench boost or triple captain. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Let's start off by looking at the five points which I have outlined for our thoughts and what we should be thinking about going from Game Week 31 and onwards. So our first thought is that we should be checking out who we should be looking to captain. you got to look at the most dangerous players for each team, the ones that have really good fixtures, and the ones that are also going to be in good form. Obviously, we don't have much of a sample size, and Game Week 30 plus is not even over yet. So we'll have to kind of play it by ear and kind of see who we can think might be a very good captaincy choice going forward. However, we can make some speculations. We know that Manchester United obviously have great fixtures. So the likes of Bruno Fernandes, Paul Pogba if he comes back in the team, Anthony Martial and the newly returning Marcus Rashford fresh off of injury could be very good options. We also have to look at Arsenal and how they play out in their double game week. Obviously, City wasn't a great game for them and obviously the red card didn't help the fact that Aubameyang was basically starved for service as well as Eddie Nketiah. But we can also look at other assets potentially if we see that Pepe starts coming back on the team. Could be a differential pick there. And we don't know how Spurs or Chelsea are going to play as they have yet to play their games as well. So the likes of Harry Kane, Tammy Abraham, Hyun Min Son, just to name a few. And this transitions us into point two, which is balancing the budget. You can't basically force all of your funds into one area, so you can't have a lot of money all in the forwards or and none in midfield or all in defense and none in attack. You have to have some sort of structure, some sort of balance to make it so that your team is just going to generate a large amount of points across the board. And you want to do that by basically getting nice price points. You want to make sure that you have players where if you need to transition them out because of whether it be a couple of bad fixtures or maybe their form is dipping or maybe they received an injury of some sort that's going to keep them out for a few games you need to make sure you have those nice price slots where you can easily get people in and out as you please prime example would be let's say you think that harry kane is a good asset for you going forward from gaming 31 onwards as spurs do have a good fixtures for the rest of the season after they play Manchester United, he's at 10.8 million. Now, if he's just not doing too well or he gets re-injured or something, you can potentially transition him if you have a little bit extra funds to the likes of Pierre and Aubameyang, who's also in that price bracket. He's 11.1 million, only a slight, slight bit of extra money needed. And it's these types of things that we kind of need to be thinking about where if we feel that we could potentially have that or need to keep an eye on that player going forward, such as, let's say, Aubameyang versus Kane, or even the likes of Bruno Fernandes versus Paul Pogba, as an example. But depending on how they play, we may see, you know, hypothetically, Bruno may be playing a more reserve role when Pogba comes back into the team, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of examples across teams that have really good fixtures. So it's just something that we need to keep an eye out when we're balancing that budget. Moving on to point three, we're looking at formation flexibility. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, it's basically how you want to set up your formation going forward. If you feel that there's a lot more value in midfield and that you would like to be playing five midfielders every week, no matter what price point they are, then you probably go with a 3-5-2. If you feel that, you know, potentially there's more value in some of the forwards, maybe some of the cheaper forwards, uh, an example would be Eddie Nketiah, who started versus... Manchester City, although he didn't score, he is at a very good price point at 4.4 million and then seems to have the place over Alexandra Lacazette. So we have to kind of basically balance that out. And you want to still main maintain that flexibility. So some game weeks, if you do have a cheaper forward like Eddie Nketiah, that you feel that he has a worse matchup than, let's say, your fifth midfielder and let's say hypothetically is Todd Cantwell from Norwich. You would prefer to play obviously Cantwell over Nketiah, but you don't want to be basically benching someone who's going to have a significant amount of funds just kind of sitting on your bench and then if they do go off it's going to feel even worse when they do rack up those points so you don't want to be let's say deciding between you know benching Harry Kane versus Bruno Fernandez as your fifth midfielder or something like that that just doesn't make sense at all so you want to basically have that formation flexibility. And the same goes for in defense as well. So you, if you know you're only going to be playing three defenders for the rest of the season, you probably want them to be up in a slightly higher price bracket, maybe one budget defender in there. And then you want to make sure that the other two are much cheaper options, but still ones that do play and start for their team. Because you don't want to obviously have in the event that let's say somebody gets rested or rotated, that they get basically removed from your team and you score a zero 
points in that slot. Uh, that's obviously something you don't want to do. You want to maximize the amount of points you have. Which segues us nicely onto point number four, which is that teams are allowed five substitutions. Now you have obviously four chances to use your subs throughout the game, any time in the first half, any time in the second half, uh, which is up to three times, and that does not include substituting at halftime. So, and you have up to five players, which means that people are obviously going to be rested more. You're going to see a lot less players going to obviously 90 minutes. And the teams from yesterday's game seem to favor using those substitutions. Obviously, Arsenal was kind of pressed into doing so because if they had only used one extra substitution, they would have lost two because of the injuries to Xhaka and Mari uh, early on in the game. So they were kind of forced uh, at their hand to basically substitute three players off at once when they went to go make their last substitution. However, this kind of does play into players that tend to be overworked or, or work really hard throughout the game. So you're thinking uh, fullbacks or, or wingbacks, you're thinking central midfielders, um, you're thinking uh, you know players that obviously they do a lot of movement, they cover a lot of grass for their team. And it could put a lot of stress on their body. So you may see them play 60 minutes one game, 30 minutes the next game, so on and so forth. So you kind of want to pick the players that you know are going to be starting in those in those games. It's also good to note that this is where the obviously the formation flexibility comes into play. Because if you know that a team is potentially going to set up in such a way that that player is probably not going to play the 60 minutes that you want them to play or thereabouts. Or maybe if you think that, let's say a defender as an example, is going to be up and down the field um, the entire game, but they have a chance of getting hooked because of the amount of minutes that they play, you may want to take a risk on them because they may get taken off You know, at 60 minutes, you get the clean sheet, and then maybe they concede a few minutes later. So there's going to be a few instances like that, and hopefully we can manage that in the best way possible. And lastly, point five is your bench players. Especially if you have your bench boost, you want to set up your team whereas your bench players are going to start and preferably get a lot of minutes to where they can score the maximum amount of points possible. These bench players are going to prove crucial because obviously, like we said with the five substitutions, players are going to be rested, players are going to be subbed off early, players are going to not start in hopes that they can come on later, and you're going to need those bench players to potentially come in and still gain you those extra few points that you would otherwise need if you had a dud on your bench. Obviously, with goalkeepers, that's less so unless they get injured and typically they they play 90 minutes every week because it's not as stressful as a role of somebody who's let's say a wing back or a central midfielder who's basically running constantly so the likes of uh Rui patricio as an example from wolves we know he's going to start every game unless he's injured uh nick pope from burnley is another example of a goalkeeper that has good fixtures towards the end of the season as well as a few after from game week 31 onwards and he could also be another option as a set and forget strategy where you do take the dud goalkeeper at 3.9 and you just play that one goalkeeper week in and week out. And that's the one that you set. Obviously, if you're going on a bench boost, you probably want a goalkeeper that's going to play. So maybe you have to balance out the budget a bit more there, which may subtract some from your higher priced defenders, midfielders or forwards. Now we can take a look at my first attempt at a wild card draft. This team could also technically be used for a free hit. I've done some different things based on how my team would kind of play out. Like one key glaring example is Lundstrom doesn't necessarily have the best fixtures moving on for the rest of the season. However, we got him in at the beginning of the season, so he keeps some value. And he's a good bench option because we know he's going to play some minutes in the game. Uh, whether it be 30 minutes or 60 minutes throughout. We're not going to start him every week, as you can see from the rest of the players on the team. So first things to start off with is that we have a set-and-forget goalkeeper in Nick Pope. This could be a, a couple of different goalkeepers. This could be David De Gea, who has very good fixtures. This could also be Rui Patricio, who has very good fixtures for Wolves as well. Basically, you can choose between the set-and-forget strategy, which I think is very good going forward, because you want to put value into the players that are going to score you probably more points or more reliable points uh, in defense, in midfield, and in attack. Moving on to the defense, you can see we put a little bit of, of budget in here. We have Trent Alexander-Arnold, obviously pretty scared of him this week, obviously doing uh, damage against Everton because of the fact that they have a lot of injuries going into the season. And he seems to be like the player from Liverpool that just is irreplaceable, basically. There's not many players that can pick out and play his position uh, to the same effect that Trent can do. Whereas there are other options for the likes of playing in midfield or in Liverpool's attack that can be kind of pseudo replaced. So like Origi can play out wide left instead of Sadio Mane. He can play through the middle instead of Roberto Firmino. 
uh, Oxley chamberlain can play out wide right instead of Mo Salah. So I think he's kind of the most irreplaceable player on their team. So probably want to keep him going forward, even if Liverpool does have the title wrapped up in only a couple of game weeks. Moving on, we then have Juan Basaka as well. This can either be Harry Maguire, but I think I'm going for more of the creative defender. He's going to be the one that's going to be swinging balls in the final third. Um, and he just seems like a, a, a better option to me, especially with the news coming out that he's, he's been more creative uh, in training and, and working on that uh, over the lockdown period. So that seems like a very reassuring sign as a Wamasaka owner. Obviously, he could also be Harry Maguire, who's also very good on his on set plays and can make passes when moving into the midfield when he makes those surging runs forward. And then lastly, obviously, we're looking at the cheaper defenders. Uh, we have Willy Bali in there. He could also be uh, changed out for the likes of Matt Doherty, as an example, from Wolves, who's more of the attacking threat. Um, he would be the more budget defender, so you'd have to basically downgrade Trent to somebody else. He could also be swapped out, like uh, for Trent, as an example, as Marcus Alonso, who also has pretty good fixtures for Chelsea. Um, and then for the other two budget defenders, we just have Lascelles, who we know is going to start game in, game out for Newcastle at a very good price point of 4.3 million. This could also be Taylor from Burnley if you choose to play him as well. And then Lundstrom we just have in there because, well, it's kind of a nuanced thing. He's he's 4.0 for our team. Uh, we got him in at the beginning of the season when he was that cheap. So there's no point in getting rid of him, even if we are benching him, because that's the kind of value that we have him at. And there's no other defender that is going to play most games, uh, that is also mispositioned at that price. Moving on to the midfield and the forwards, we're going to basically combine those into one cohesive unit as they kind of often revolve around similar price points or flex how the team is going to be played. With this team, I've chosen to basically go with a 3-4-3 overall, obviously with the forwards being heavily priced in that of Pierre McBombing, Marcus Rashford, and Raul Jimenez. With Rashford, I think he's just one of the key, if not the most important player in Manchester United's team alongside Bruno Fernandes now. And he's going to be someone who's going to be looking to get back amongst the goals. He's obviously on set pieces as well in terms of direct free kicks. Um, and the likes of Aubameyang is obviously going to be on penalties as well as being just overall the most potent threat for Arsenal. Although they he didn't have a good showing in the game versus Man City, but that was largely to the fact that Basically, David Luiz kind of more or less ruined the game. And that they just were starved for chances because City kind of just suffocated the midfield. And Arsenal having to make early substitutions for injuries and, and players that wouldn't have otherwise played had the other players remained fit is kind of a downfall to uh, the performance that Aubameyang put out on the field. But nonetheless, he does obviously have really good fixtures going forward. So it's obviously someone to keep an eye out for. He could also be swapped out for the likes of Harry Kane. We obviously have Hyunmin Son in there, who's going to provide us great value at 9.7 and is going to be a talisman for Spurs if they are to make their top four surge. Kane, obviously, is someone who's struggled with injury, obviously hasn't looked himself uh, in recent weeks, obviously before the season uh, took its long break. But maybe the long break might help out Harry Kane and he might basically re-spark that that. that dynamism that he had with Hyunmin Son and basically they get back to scoring form and play quite well we'll kind of see how they kind of start out against Manchester United that could be a good gauge as to where Spurs' level is um, but overall I think Hyunmin Son is probably better in this situation obviously Aubameyang can be downgraded to Nketiah and then funds could be spread elsewhere Moving on to some of the smaller midfield players. So we obviously have Mason Mountain there for Chelsea. Obviously very good. Very good price point at 6.2. He could also be swapped out for other midfielders if you have a little bit of extra cash lying around as well. Obviously Harvey Barnes priced at the same price point at 6.2 is very good and been very successful for Leicester City. As well as Saar over at Watford is obviously super pacey and obviously provides a lot of threat going forward for Watford who started to pick it up before the break happened. And then lastly, obviously, the position that I'm kind of a bit kind of iffy about is Adama Traore. Obviously, with Joe took kind of his resurgence into the team, they kind of play without Traore in a front three. Um, and he obviously is someone who is seems like more of a bench threat. Um, we won't be playing him, obviously, game in, game out because of with the three forwards that we have in this current system that we are employing. 
but he could be someone to watch out for because if he obviously shows form, 5.7 is obviously a good price point for a midfielder and could be a way to basically free up a little bit extra cash to where you can upgrade Mount to the likes of Saar or maybe upgrade your Manchester United midfielder to Bruno Fernandes if you only had, like let's say, Martial. Um, or even potentially if you thought that Kevin De Bruyne was seeing less minutes and you wanted to go for somebody a little bit um, a little bit higher price point, such as Raheem Sterling, you could potentially change that out as well. That's going to do it for this video. hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, make sure to leave a comment down below on what team you have going into game week 31 or what you're looking at in terms of your wild card, free hit, or any transfers that you look to be making. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like, make sure to subscribe if you're new, and make sure to turn those notification bells on. And give us a follow over on Twitter and Twitch, where we post all of our videos, and when we stream for our game week discussions. It's PilotFlame226 on all platforms. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.